What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode here on the Spear Education Learning Series and sharing with you some insight on some topics in dentistry that keep you up at night. And so this is the second episode of this learning series and very excited to be back with you. Um, today, we're going to talk about something I have a feeling that might keep some of you up at night, and that is insurance and collections. I think insurance for one reason and collections for another, uh, but very honored to have with us Dr. Dr. Rachel Gold, um, who's been practicing dentistry in Cold Spring, Kentucky. That's Northern Kentucky since 2010. So Dr. Gold, it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then we have uh, Mandy Deaton, who is a practice growth manager with Spear Education. Mandy, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing awesome. And I'm really excited to have the both of you because I know that you work together. And so I know there's going to be a chemistry between the two of you, obviously, from Dr. Gold's perspective in the practice and then your perspective in helping her. So that's the way that we're going to go about this. I've got some questions uh, for both of you along the lines of insurance and collections. And so um, I thought that's where we'd start. Uh, but, you know, one one place where I wanted to go first, Dr. Gold, is that there's been a lot of talk about practices, you know, starting to, you know, uh, go out of network and, and all of that. So let's start there. Like, why do you think from your perspective that a lot more practices are starting to look at that? Oh, wow. Um, well, I can tell you context matters for my situation um, and COVID really sparked this idea of we had to kind of curate down our schedule. We had two months of, of a backlog of full hygiene appointments that um, we had to reschedule. And then we were having to eliminate some of the appointments that we were seeing in that short term after COVID hit. How are we going to manage you know, new protocols, all of the unknown? Uh, and we didn't know, we already had a full schedule. We didn't know where to put patients. And um, we started looking at ways to drive value for the appointments in our practice. And everybody knows that COVID drove at the price of everything up. Um, the mass exodus from hygiene, we're paying our hygienists a lot more than we used to. Um, and we needed to look at the numbers in the practice and find out where we could make some changes while not sacrificing quality of care. Um, maintaining jobs for my team members was really important, really valuable. Um, and just trying to get away from some of the games that I think we have to play, uh, to be in network. Um, and that is, that's a full-time job for somebody on my team. Um, and trying to kind of <laughs> uncuff ourselves from, from those things. Uh, and that's kind of where it started for us. Yeah. Mandy, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, hearing Dr. Gold speak takes me back to that time period where I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of dental practices. And I feel like, and I'm sure Dr. Gold will mention this, that so many practice owners really felt like they were on an island, uh, even along the lines of like feeling that heavy responsibility of what they normally just feel and running the practice and taking care of patients and let alone something that was thrust upon them and having to make these decisions while all of this was going on in the insurance space, like, you know, Dr. Gold was mentioning. So can you share how you have been able to help her, right? Because I feel like what's been so beneficial with somebody like yourself is that you're a practice owner, you're on this island and you're looking around and you're like, who is there that can help me that might have some perspective of what other practice owners are doing and how they're even going to navigate, you know, this, 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 this journey. Yeah. Uh, you know, when practices determine or decide that they want to go out of network, the instant assumption is, is that they're going to lose, you know, all of their patients on that plan. And that's not always the case, right? Patients will stay if they build a relationship with the dentist or the team and they trust the dentist and the team, um, regardless of insurance participation. So, you know, we're able to really help them and prepare them ahead of time and give them the tools to build these long term relationships with patients. So insurance doesn't matter. And that's what's really important is, you know, if they trust you, they believe in you, your quality of dentistry is good, they'll stay regardless of insurance. 
Yeah. And, 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 I'll, and I'll say to the both of you, like I'm an entrepreneur and I have learned a lot in the last couple of years of what it means like to have insurance, not have insurance. And there's a lot of things that I learned that brought that level of fear down when I realized that there were, there was other options out there. And as the both of you know, sometimes patients don't, don't know that. Uh, so Mandy, like when, when we talk about notifying patients of these changes, how far in advance do you recommend that a practice does that? Yeah, it varies. And the reason I say it varies is because it depends, it depends on the hygiene department and how booked out they are, right? If you have a practice that is on a six month routine and they're not booked out six, eight, nine months beyond that, then you can start letting patients know six to eight months prior to you going out of network. But if your hygiene department is extremely booked out and they're on that eight, nine, 10 month cadence, then you've got to start that process a lot earlier. Some practices, 12 to 18 months, they start having these conversations about potentially going out of network in the near future. And Dr. Gold, it's one thing, right, to sit around with your team, sit around with your colleagues and say, okay, I'm going to do this or what have you. It's a whole other thing when we're sitting in your seat, having to have that conversation with your patients. So how were you able to handle that? Like how responsive were they? Can you, can you talk a little bit about what that was like for you? Yeah. Um, I have a great team. I have a very engaged front office team um, that I think a lot of the benefit of um, the practice solutions platform has really engaged them even more so they can see what's happening. They can see the numbers, they can see, um, you know, where the production and collections are, are compared to where they were last year. Um, and we had the conversation about starting to have the conversation at the six month mark. So six months, someone would come in for their recall visit and we would start planting that seed that it was, it was likely to happen. Um, and that this was the date. Uh, and we would answer as many questions as we could. Some benefit plans make it very easy for us to give people an estimate of what's going to happen. And some make it very, very hard. Um, and that fear of the unknown, I think, existed for us and for our patient family because we want to encourage people to stay, but we also don't want to give any misleading information. So we had to be very clear about that, that in this specific case, most recently, we knew that the benefit plan was not going to tell us, nor was it going to tell the patient on what fee schedule they were going to pay out of network. So it was a lot harder to give them estimates for what they could expect. Um, but we tried to face to face with every patient that came in the door that had that specific plan. Um, timing doesn't always work out where we can have that conversation with the patient before they go into their open enrollment with their employer, which would always be ideal, but those are kind of all over the place. So it's really hard to, to um, be strategic about that, I find. Um, but for the patients we didn't have one-on-one -on -one contact with, um, we did send a letter, which I hate to do. I just feel like, again, I always think context is super important and, and being able to answer their questions in that time um, when you're one-on-one, -on -one, I think is invaluable because so often you get a letter, you read it, you stop after the first line of, we will no longer be in network with your insurance on this date. And then it goes in the trash and they call the next dentist on the list. Um, so that's not our preferred way to do it, but we did have, you know, some situations like that, where that was the, the only way we could let them know. Um, but I think ultimately you just have to have a team that believes on where you're headed, why you're making the choices, um, and believe that when they're having a conversation with your patient, that this is still the right place for them and that we're going to do everything we can to make that work and make it affordable, um, while also being really proud of the quality of care that we've provided and let that kind of stand for itself. Yeah. And I've had the opportunity over the last several years to watch a lot of webinars and presentations all throughout dentistry. And it's interesting, right? I started to see, as I'm sure the both of you did, more and more presentations and webinars and speakers of practices talking about going out of network. It was like this this, this trend, right. That was, it was little by yeah. little by little. And again, I feel like a lot of practice owners and people in our industry, like we're starting to get a little bit more confident, but as you know, Dr. Gold, it's one thing to say, okay, 
now I feel like I'm not on an island. Now I feel like a lot of my other colleagues are kind of doing this as well. So I feel that confidence. But where the rubber meets the road is on your production. So as you started to go down this path, can you talk a little bit about the impact on, on the production of the practice? Because I think that's where the silver lining is, because that's one of the reasons why we're, we're here as well, is that you know, we want everybody watching this learning series that if, if you're not sleeping at night, these two have some good insight in regards to how you can you know, sleep a little bit better and know that there's, there's positive on the other side of this. Sure. Um, so we went out of network with a very big uh, benefit plan in March. And we had a lot of patients initially say, yeah, we're going to give it a, we're going to give it a try. We like being patients in your practice. We're going to come, we're going to see how our benefit plan pays and then we'll kind of go from there. Um, and in the first six months, it, you know, it didn't feel a whole lot different. I will tell you that I felt like I was grinding a little bit less hard. Um, numbers stayed pretty much the same. Um, but sometimes that feeling I had to, I had to divorce myself from that feeling that if I was grinding and moving fast, I was being more productive. Um, so that was, I think some of the mental gymnastics that I had to do for myself, but we would check in on things and, and things looked, looked pretty good. And they were staying pretty consistent to where we had been for the last year. But I felt more relaxed at work. I felt um, like I had more time to really sit and spend and and focus and not be, you know, where where's the next place I have to be? Where's the next room that needs me? Um, and we're, after that six month mark, we have, you know, we've seen some patients say, you know, this isn't feasible. These fees aren't feasible for my family. We're going to have to explore something else. And we've had some patients leave and we've already had some patients come back. Um, but, you know, year over year, we're having a good year. And the the big shift has not impacted production numbers uh, in a negative way at all. Um, we just we all feel like we have a little bit more time in our day to to not have to grind so hard. <laughs> And Mandy, uh, I think, again, what's so important about your relationship with Dr. Gold is that, you know, she, she, she has had somebody in you to give insight, right? Uh, your perspective. And so how, how have you helped her with this, right? Like given her ideas uh, and, and along those lines, even amplified the opportunity, right? To, to kind of be there, to share with her some different ideas that, like she said, I mean, she was grinding, she had to, you know, figure out a way to make it work. She's got that on her shoulders, but then she's had you to be able to kind of offer some insight. How, how have you been able to help her with that? Yeah, we have some great conversations. I will say that. And she has an amazing team. Um, so that helps a lot as well. And when I say she has an amazing team, I, I don't just mean that they're just great people and they are, but they really are focused on the patients and what is best for the patients. So having those conversations with her and her team about how can we educate the patients better or differently on the dentistry that we're recommending so that they accept the treatment, which in turn keeps the production up, right? But it it stems back to what I said in the beginning about trust and relationships, right? Patients will, will purchase when they trust people or they feel value for what they're purchasing. And that's what Dr. Gold's team does really well is they work hard on educating the patients on the value of the dentistry so that they do it and the production stays up. Um, some practices that focus a lot on, you know, getting patients in and not the quality of the visit, not rolling out that red carpet for each patient, will see a drastic drop, a drop in production. But um, we really focus on build the relationship, build the trust so that they come regardless of the, of the insurance plan and or the cost of the dentistry. And um, also we, we work with practices and specifically Dr. Gold's team on what do our financial arrangements look like? Do we have a solid financial arrangement system set up in our practice to help patients afford the dentistry that they need? And I'll just say, I, I'm not sure. Sometimes you don't want to say the quiet part out loud, right? But we needed, in my practice, we needed a little bit of attrition. I felt like 
Um, we needed to create space in our hygiene schedule to drive new patients. We needed to be able to offer new patient appointments in a more timely manner than we were able to based on how far out we were booked. Um, and not to ever devalue any patient in your practice. But when I say I needed some attrition, I, I wanted to retain the patients that valued us as much as we were valuing them. And I think that sometimes when they find your name on a list, there's, you're treated much more like a commodity. Uh, Patients, when they find you because someone referred them to you or they read your reviews and they, another conversation for a different day, but when they (laughs) say, I have, you have tons of wonderful reviews and I asked my community and this is where they told me to come. And I know you don't take my benefit plan or you're not a network with my benefit plan but I felt like I had to be here anyway. I think that the relationship starts from a foundational perspective and, and, and put from a position of strength. Um, and I think that is super, super valuable. And that has shifted a, about the way that I go about my days. Um, and I, again, like I said, maybe that's the quiet yeah. part that you have that you say out loud sometimes. Um, but that's really where I think my practice was. Uh, you, I think when you're in network with so many things, you either have to get bigger and bigger and bigger so that you can work faster and have more people so that you can keep up with the demands that exist financially. Um, or like I said earlier, kind of curate things down a little bit so that there is a mutual level of value between patient and dental team. And I've seen, I've seen that shifting. It's crazy when I even just think about this and I realize again, putting myself in the shoes of a patient, like just how conditioned we have all been as patients, right? Mm -hmm. To go about the way that you just described, Rachel, in regards to like finding a provider and all of that. Like it's just, I mean, this whole thing has, has been apparent to me, like it's been apparent to all of you and there's unintended consequences, right? Uh, Both positive and negative. And, And I love hearing you share that through some of these challenges, it like created some space for you, as I'm sure it's created for tons of practice owners to not only be able to step back and look at like how you wanted to practice moving forward, where dentistry was evolving, how insurance companies are evolving. But I think it's great, Mandy, like from your perspective to be also to be alongside with her to for the things that, that you see. And so Rachel, when I think about the pros and cons, uh, I'm sure there's some insurance companies that you kept Um, because there's goods and bads with this, right? We don't want to paint this picture that a practice can completely go away from that. And so we want to be, you know, honest about that. So let's touch on that. Like, what what are some pros and cons? But I think more importantly, like, can you talk about some of the insurance companies that you did keep and why? You want me to use names? Please. Okay. I just didn't, I didn't know we were doing that. Um, So Mandy's heard me say, I think a million times, I don't, sitting where I'm sitting today, do I have to be a fee for service practice? No, I don't know if that makes sense for me in my location demographically. Um, uh, I just, I don't know. I I can't say never, but, um, the, the journey kind of started for me. I went out of network with MetLife first. Um, and that was right after COVID they were my lowest paying, um, insurance company by far. One of the things that I've done, um, and this kind of predates practice solutions, but have we used that information to kind of integrate into looking at, you know, other stats, but I created a spreadsheet where I was essentially cataloging uh, patient interactions, percentage of patient interactions in a month based on each uh, benefit plan and uh, how much I was collecting from the from both the patient, from the insurance um, plan, and then trying to match up. If I'm seeing 10% of my patients or 10% of my interactions with patients this month for this benefit plan, I don't want to be collecting 5% from that plan. Right? So I I was looking at those numbers. And when those numbers started to get out of whack, I started to go, wait. And it wasn't always the lowest paying plan that was the next one on the list. I mean, we know we all exist in communities where certain benefit plans maybe kind of start to take over. Right? Um, and then all the big employers start to pick up those plans and then it just becomes this flood 
And when you've got an insurance company that, like Delta Dental, for example, who I've been in practice in my practice for nine and a half years, who's never negotiated a fee schedule with me, how can I keep doing what I'm doing while my hygienist is making 50% more than they were making when they started with me? 50% as a stretch, let's say 35% more than when they started with me. Um, my overhead has gone up because supplies have gone up, cost of everything has gone up. Um, you would think that to the average person that makes sense, but it doesn't always translate, right? Um, so I have stayed in network with the companies, quite frankly, that are willing to negotiate my fee schedule um, that I find don't absorb an inordinate amount of time from an administrative perspective to argue and fight and refile and get them to pay claims. Um, and that's kind of been where we are at this point in time. Uh, we've stayed in network with a couple of local, like locally owned kind of smaller benefit plans um, that I, I, where we can call and like get somebody on the phone that isn't going to make us wait on hold for 45 minutes to get a breakdown and then, oh, we sent you the wrong thing. Sorry. Some of those kind of things that just don't make sense from an administrative perspective have higher value to me now than they used to. Um, and I mean, I, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of where yeah. we, where we are now. Um, but yeah, so the, you know, the two big ones in my practice, a few years apart, but seem to be kind of bombarding us. Uh, initially it was MetLife and they, they paid very low out of network. They pay excellent in network. Most of our patients don't haven't felt a shift at all there. Um, but Delta Dental is the one. Delta is the tough one. That's the big nut. Um, and that is a, a huge paradigm shift for the patients because they have benefits, but they still have to pay us our full fee on the way out the door because we don't know who's going to pay us directly or who's going to pay the patient. We don't, We you know, unless you get a, a, um, a predetermination, you don't exactly know where they're where they're going to stand when they pay um so it's really hard to estimate and it's getting easier as we've been you know we're eight months into this this ex i don't want to call it an experiment but this journey uh we're learning more about the individual plans the different employer plans we're having a, a much easier time giving estimates and trying to help people understand their benefits but that first kind of six months of waiting to see claims come in uh, we were flying a little bit blind um, and for the most part, it was patients that were coming in for recall, uh, so much harder to get like a predetermination for a periodic exam. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mandy, how about you? Uh, have you worked with, seen other practices that are, you know, that have had this dilemma and, uh, love to hear your opinion on it. Yeah, this is the hot topic. This is the topic of conversation in many, many phone calls that, that I've had, that we have with, with customers. Um, you know, everybody wants to get out of insurance because their negotiated fees are so low and the insurance companies like Dr. Gold mentioned are not willing to negotiate. And, you know, I, I think that if it makes sense, do it. And what I mean by that is, um, and, and Dr. Gold is proof of this, do your homework, right? Take a look at how many patients you have on that plan first to see what it could potentially and how that could impact your practice. Um, what are the reimbursement fees? Have you made an attempt or two or three to try to negotiate those reimbursement fees with the insurance company? Um, and then, you know, what is it? What is it community wise? Do you want to stay in this because it happens to be part of a school district that is, you know, a big part of your community? So you got to take that into consideration as well. But, you know, if it makes sense and you've done your homework and you've planned for this, it can be done successfully. She's proof of that. Her practice is proof of that. But it does take time. And that's one of the, the biggest hurdles that we face with doctors and practices is they want it done yesterday, right? And it takes time and you have to go through the process to do it right. If not, it can be detrimental to some practices. And that's not a place where you want to be. Yeah, no question. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Say, yeah, sorry, please. Sorry. No, please. Yeah. I mean, I think this, the thing that is has been the biggest hurdle for me 
I think anytime you make a large change in your practice, you can anticipate a little bit of shakeup, be it on the patient side or on the team side. And I've mm-hmm. experienced that this year. Um, some people, when I mean, when you when you make a kind of a change like this, some people don't want to work as hard. They don't want to have to convince the patients of as much. They don't want to. <laughs> that that's how it feels to them, right? They're not interested in putting in the work to learn the communication skills to continue to have to relay these things to our patients over and over and over again. And for this, you know, short term, it's a kind of a short term pain for a long term gain from my perspective. Um, but not everybody sees it like like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I I think that that has kind of been more of the sleepless nights for me than the than the production and the collections, honestly, is that those big shifts in your in your practice have can kind of have a trickle down effect related to the people that are really comfortable with the status quo. And I think there's a there can be a lot of that sometimes. Um, and although we had endless conversations about where we were going and where which direction we were heading and why. And I think our reasons were very good. Um, you can't always just get people to come along with with you. Uh, and so that that's just something I feel like needs to be said. And it I you know feels like a failure in the front end, but as you kind of come through it, you realize that very often some of these people that you thought were so integral to the team, you know, maybe they're there was something better out there. I don't. Yeah. Well, first <laughs> off, I, uh, I love your, your candor. I think it's what everybody needs. Uh, and I think you said something there that, that, that I wanted to, to bring back up. And that is, is to not lose sight of the impact, the real impact that these situations have had on practice owners and the teams or what have you. And Mandy, as you know, because you, you you deal with this all the time, right? When you're working with practices, like this is this is a real thing. And so, you know, not only as you know, Rachel, you know, is it difficult to practice dentistry and to run the business and all of the other challenges um, that you've that you've dealt with, but then like what you've had to go through with this and and then like you said, having to make those decisions. And I think what's encouraging is that as you have seen, is that it sounds like you have grown as a professional. And, you know, I've been saying this for years. For some reason, it blew my mind. I, I, I never knew why a practice owner was never looked upon like an entrepreneur, right? Like we, we give all of this credit to like entrepreneurs that start tech companies and all these things or whatever and start their businesses from scratch. But the reality is, is that a dentist, whether you're, you know, taking over a practice or you're starting a Genova or whatever the case may be, like you're an entrepreneur. And so you have all of those challenges in addition to be able to practice dentistry and do what you love, which is take care of patients. And then you've had to go through all of this and you touched on it in the beginning, which is, you know, you were kind of on an Island and you needed to make sure that, you know, you had somebody there to support you. So I want to kind of bring us back around from where we started and have you share a little bit with everybody of what it's been like to work with Mandy, to work with, you know, SPS and, and how beneficial that's been for you to have that resource. I mean, you know, there's no secret to anybody that's watching this is that, you know, you're a motivated individual. You have a very successful practice. You've come through this in a very positive way. Um, but it sounds like it's been beneficial for you to, to have Mandy by your side. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Mandy. Uh, Mandy is, we're very, I think, like-minded um, and not that you have to be. Sometimes you need somebody to, that, that is different than you to kind of bring you along. But um, Mandy has experience on the other side of, you know, if you're talking about ownership and, and the team, she's, she's been on the other side of that and she's worked with enough offices to kind of have seen some of the, the pitfalls and things that I haven't seen because I haven't been on that side. Um, and I don't feel, uh, I always feel like our, our conversations are, I'm always heard and I'm always trying to receive feedback the best that I can. But I think the best part about Mandy is that my team also trusts her to reach out to her directly and individually and have a conversation with her that they may be honestly struggling to have with me. Um, and that has been just like a huge benefit for our work on communication within my team. Um, 
because I mean, this does, this has been a transition time and there's always, you know, there's always emotions that go and I think go into any time of transition in anything. Um, and uh, uh, Mandy is like our, like our team psychologist a little bit. Um, but, and she, but she also like, she knows the numbers, she knows her stuff. She's looking, she's looking at the numbers with me and she's, you know, saying, this is great. This is not great. What are we going to do about this? Here's some things that we can implement. Let's talk, let's shift, let's shift our team meeting focus to this as we're moving in to the next, you know, stage. Um, things that I didn't know, I didn't know. And uh, I think that is the big piece because to your point, I mean, as the dentist, you have to do it all. You have to be HR, you have to be PR, you have to be, you have to be the, the workhorse, you have to pay the bills, you have to be the accountant. And you're only, I think, as good as the people that you surround yourself with. Um, and it just feels a lot less lonely right? Not working on that island when you've got someone to reach out to um, and someone that knows more than me about different <laughs> facets of things. Um, and she certainly, see, she's been that for us. Um, yeah, I think that. Um, well, Mandy, uh, so, well, I love that. And, I, you know, I, when I think about the work that, that you do and, you know, Spear Practice Solutions and what have you, uh, and I'm curious for your thoughts on this, like I think about a practice bringing in a coach, a consultant, right? We, we've seen it in dentistry for years. And I feel like so often we try to put things into like a sandbox, right? Like this particular person is going to help you. Like today we're talking about insurance and collections. And sure, like it's a specific part of the practice that a practice may need help with or like Rachel needs needed help with. But as I've listened to the both of you and particularly, you know, Dr. Gold, like what, what I'm taking from this conversation is just that it's more than that, right? Like that's just the beginning, like where, where, where it really feels like you have been able to be of help to her and her team. It goes beyond like these, these little items we put in a sandbox of like what a practice needs to move forward. But what has it been like from your perspective, like as far as like being there for her and her team for those specific things that you want to help her with? Like she mentioned the numbers and things like that on the business side, but, to, to, but more than that, just to be there is kind of like somebody that can help her move along, you know, through this transition. Yeah. I, you know, I, it, it's a relationship just like with patients and we, we, it takes some time to build that relationship and that trust. And we have that and we work very well together and her team and, and I work very well together as well. Um, but I got to tell you, it, it comes from the top down, right? Dr. Gold's an excellent leader. She's an excellent leader in many ways, but when it comes to taking the resources and the learning from Spear Practice Solutions and that I can go over with them, she lets the team run with it. And what I mean by that is, is they can take the resources and the learning and make it theirs and put it into their practice on what works best for them. It's not, you know, she doesn't, she's not so rigid and saying you have to exactly say it this way, right? Take what you learn and make it yours. And there's quite frankly, not a lot of leaders out there that do that. And that's where the disconnect is between them and their team, right? And um, she's amazing in that area. So the success with the resources that is offered to her, what she implements and her team implement with patients, it, it's, it's, we work together, right? It's, I'm part of their practice. I'm part of their team. And I truly feel like that every single time I get on a call with them. And we run ideas past each other. What's working? What's not? What challenges are you facing? Right? And we talk through it. And um, she's got a super engaged team. And that's what makes her so successful. It really is. I mean, she's got the clinical skills and the team to back it. And it's it's really amazing to be part of it and to watch it fold out the way it does. And if I can just add, you know, talk a lot about insurance and collections and production in this in in this um, last thirty minutes or so. I and Mandy can correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't have uh, a problem in my practice with collections or production. I have my office manager is an exceptional office manager. She collects what we produce. Um, but in the transition, having support team to say, here are some of the pitfalls we see when these changes happen. How can we make sure that we don't take a non-problem and allow it to become a problem? Um, that was That's always the concern um, or was a concern for me as we did this transition. 
Um, so I just, you know, that was the big fear for me, right? Like, am I about to make a non-issue an issue for me? Um, so, but Mandy helped us like kind of a late, you know, sometimes you just need somebody to be like, this leap that you want to take is not crazy. You're, to- it's a totally reasonable choice and we're, we're going to create strategies and we're going to get there. Or you're crazy. Don't take it. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> We've yeah, had yeah, those yeah. Conversations too. Right. I mean, you've, well, I don't think you've done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one. Mandy, I'm glad that I'm glad that she mentioned that because what I was going to say here to close this out was that we got to see this very authentic side, right, of Dr. Gold. But I was going to mention she does have a very successful practice, right? Oh, and so I think yeah. that's right. So like, but 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 I'm so glad, Rachel, that you've shared with us these last 30 minutes, like what that transition has been like because that's real, right? I think that's what so many people watching this, other practice owners, your colleagues are going to connect with you on because you can't sugarcoat this stuff. Regardless of where your practice is, whether you're starting it out or you have a successful practices, these have been real challenges and these are challenges that practices are facing. And certainly to have somebody like Mandy there by your side, you know, from Spear Practice Solutions has been, has been, you know, a big plus. So uh, listen, this has been an absolute pleasure, you know, to, to speak with the both of you. And before we go, I just, one last word. So, so Rachel, if you can close us out and, and then, and then Mandy, love to hear from you as we, uh, as we wrap. Um, I think that in the last few years, as I, I, I don't know, I feel like I'm entering the, the sophomore year of my career. Is that fair? Something like that. My, t- my husband's a teacher and he teaches sophomores. So I feel like that like rings true for me. Um, I just, when people kind of ask me, like you go to see, why are you here? And I, I continue to just have this idea that I'm just working towards being great. And being great to me does not mean somebody puts me on the list of the best dentist somewhere. I don't think that that's something that you can quantify. But I think being great means that I have the respect of my team, the respect of my patients, happy team, happy patients, healthy team, healthy patients. And I think the only way that you can be great is by surrounding yourself with great. And having Mandy on my team has absolutely been a step towards greatness for me. So I think that's just super valuable. Mandy, oh, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of like a <laughs> mic drop moment, right? But I, but I didn't want to, you, you know. You can pay I, me later. <laughs> uh oh, yeah i mean like br- bring us home Mandy. That, that like i said i mean just you know uh any any last thoughts yeah you know i think this was a really great conversation because we talked about the pros and the cons right and there are both to this but it can be done successfully and dr bull's just you know um one example of that but if i can encourage anyone right about insurance and thinking about getting out of network is take your time and do your research first, right? And get the information that you need. Talk about the pros and the cons. Get your team involved in it. And it will. It can be a super successful transition. Um, but I will say it's, it's a much easier transition when you get to work with clients like Dr. Gold and her team because, um, it, it, again, it's like being part of their team and being there. I look forward to phone calls with them. I look forward to the challenges that they give me every time we talk and say, hey, this is what we're facing. How can you help us overcome it? So it really is, it, it's a partnership. And, and that's how it works so successfully. Well, whatever challenges we have ahead, I've been in dentistry for 20 years. And if, you know, we've got, you know, dentists like Dr. Gold and, and individuals like Mandy that are out there helping. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's very encouraging for, for where the industry is going. And I think if you are currently a spirit practice solution, you know, customer and you're working with someone, you know, I thought hopefully this has been, you know, engaging for you to understand the challenges and, and how you can work together. And if you're watching this on any of the social media channels or social media channels or emails, and you're not, you know, I think this is a great example of what it means to have somebody by your side, regardless of where your practice is, is, is growth and all of that. So, uh, ladies, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. And uh, we're going to continue this learning series moving forward, uh, hopefully getting you more sleep at night. That's uh, definitely Spear Education's goal. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.